Uh, so everyone got a clicker. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you a bit about some of the clicker activities that we've been using in Bio220. So that's the ecology evolution class at the 200 level that we do here. And uh, this is only the second time that I have taught this course and the second time ever using clickers. So I'm quite the novice um, compared, and veteran compared to many of you in this room. So. Um, what, one of the, the main things that I found that was a challenge was uh, not just using the clickers, let me see if I can remember the buttons correctly, is that is, is showing, is um, being able to use clickers in an effective way that is actually also interesting. So here's how I used to use clickers. I would show students something. I would say, look, population density increases the amount of nitrate that's exported into rivers. And then I would say, oh, I would go forward instead of backwards. And then I would ask them, what did I just say? And they could always answer it exactly right. They did great. Um, they used those questions to study for their exams. They thought they were awesome. But I always felt this was really unsatisfying because I just asked them to regurgitate immediately what I just said to them. So this time around, I decided to be a bit more creative and think of different ways to be able to use these cool little tools um, to actually make it more interesting and also uh, get students to be using their brains in different ways and we're used to asking them to use their brains. So here's how I would ask the same question again. Instead, I would just ask them the question and show them the evidence and then ask them the clicker question. So you guys can probably do this. So make sure you turn on the on off button. Answer this question for me. How does population density influence the amount of nitrate exported into rivers? I have to uh, start. And then I could see, you guys use eye clickers before? I had never have either. So uh, that's the number of people that have logged in. And um, if you voted, your vote status button should turn green. Um, Brian actually should be explaining how to use eye clickers and not me, because he is our local expert. So if you have more questions about clickers later, he's the man to ask. So um, I think I will stop here and uh, start stop. OK, and then you guys did a great job. <laughs> so in comparison, let me show you how the students did on a question like this. So you guys did quite marginally better. I'm impressed. <laughs> so but, but the, the, what this shows is that you, know, you don't have to have any expert knowledge besides being able to read a graph. And so together, you can construct knowledge instead of you know, telling students A, B, C, OK, what's A, B, and C? They can do that. But if you say, you know, what's A, what's B, and then you tell me what C is, they can usually do that if you give them enough practice. And it's pretty cool when they do. And actually, uh, for a while there, I wasn't telling them they were doing that. And they were not impressed with themselves. So I said, hey, you guys are doing something cool here. You are using your brains in ways you thought you couldn't. And so then they got more comfortable, and they started being able to do more and more complex things. So OK. And oh, yeah, I can use this. So I'm going to give you a, a, a short um, a set of examples of how I have done these different things with clickers, constructing knowledge, sort of like we just did, um, using problem solving skills immediately with information, so applying knowledge, uh, making predictions, taking a really complex concept and breaking it down piece by piece, and then finally to generate discussion, which this is a 300 something student class. And discussion is a sort of weird thing for a class that big, but you can actually do it. And there are different sort of active learning uh, philosophies on how you, you do accomplish this. And I think other speakers here will talk about it. But you know, if you get students to talk first amongst themselves, you go around and you listen to them, you will find that a clicker question can generate um, lots and lots of discussion. And then if you get them used to it, then they'll actually talk to you and volunteer their answers. And it was pretty cool to see you know, in a class that big, students being confident in being able to address the whole entire class because they had already done it a little bit in their own group. OK. So for each of these, I'm going to show you what I wanted them to know how to do, and then the clicker questions and how I set up the clicker question to ask them um, uh, uh, to see if they could do that. 
Okay, so uh, there is an idea in ecology where you are you measure biodiversity using different sorts of measures, and so we did lots and lots of them. I'm just going to show you a couple. Um, a very simple one uh, would well. So first, I set them up with a problem, which is to uh, tell me if my farm or the old neighbor's farm was more diverse, and uh, you know you. You could have different ways of measuring this, and they talked about that first. Um, and then we went into the different uh, uh, official measures that people use. One of the simplest ones is species richness. So that's basically just the number of species that are present. And so if you take the previous picture and list out who is there, uh, that's what I have, and that's what old neighbor has. So let's see, let's do, you guys can do one more, right? Because this is fun. So who has greater species richness according to this definition? Is um, supposed to stay on? I don't know. I don't think so. I think it's just flashes. It flashes? OK. So how many have clickers here? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. OK, so when we get about 13, 14, I think that's everybody. OK, so stop, display. OK, so uh, some of you were undecided. Or um, we, had, we had some different uh, responses here. Uh, you guys, have any of you used clickers before? I didn't even ask. Have any of you used clickers in the classroom? No? So I'll, I'll just talk a little bit about how you can facilitate uh, the transfer of knowledge with clickers a tiny bit for those of you who aren't familiar. So when you get some, so, some responses like this, um, yes, everyone's going to think the right vote is the one that has the majority of points, but that's not necessarily going to always be true. And you, know, you can get, get judge yourself from your classroom what your threshold is for how much time you spend explaining when there are some splits. So, for me, any time around 90% would usually, OK, I don't have to spend a lot of time explaining. Um, the students can talk amongst themselves and uh, set that the remaining 10% right, um, or send, set, set that remaining 10% who didn't get it right right. Uh, but it's kind of up to you to decide. And you kind of want to make it clear to the classroom that that's what you're doing. So they'll know when to expect a long explanation and when not to. So how did the students do? So you guys were about equal there. Yeah. OK, so here's a more complicated one. Here, this involves an equation. So for those of you who are in biology, know that a lot of biology students get freaked out when they have to use math, because math shouldn't be in biology. These are two different subjects. What in the world are you doing to us? Uh, we, we actually use quite a lot of math in ecology. Um, and so we try to get students used to doing math and doing it right away. So I'm not going to explain the equation to you, but after going through describing what the equ equation means, um, I set them up with a problem. So they have to calculate the, this index for my farm. And I give them a little time to do it. And then when they're ready, um, we talk about what the answer is. And then I tell them a clicker question is coming. You're going to have to calculate this. And then they get freaked out, and they ask for more time, which is fine. Uh, and um, uh, they have to fill in this this table the rest of the way and uh, come up with the answer to this question of who has more diversity according to this index. And uh, because I know you guys didn't bring your scientific calculators with the log button, we'll skip that. Um, and you can see that actually, you know, when students are working together on a complex problem like this, they can do pretty well. So, so the correct answer is B. 1.6, I think, was higher than 1.3 on the previous slide. And so they, they did pretty good there. OK, so uh, another activity we did using clickers um, involved making predictions. And then we did a sort of pseudo experiment using a simulation model that was available online. So I had them first make a whole series of predictions, and then we kind of did the experiment. And so this involved trying to predict what happens to organisms, um, how they move across a landscape that has different features. So you know, being able to cross rivers and, and mountains and that sort of, that sort of idea. 
So this example I gave, where with these two species of butterfly that eats this plant, this plant is distributed in only these dark green patches. So these butterflies have to be able to fly from patch to patch to be able to survive in the landscape. And so then we talked about some different scenarios of habitat loss where you don't have some of these patches, you don't have all of those middle patches, or you have only the middle patches. And given some information about these butterflies, they had to be able to predict which species would be more persistent in each of those scenarios. So they got together in their groups and they answered this question for each scenario. So for the first one, um, the prediction sort of went all over the place. But more or less, they thought they'd be equally persistent in this scenario where no habitat was destroyed. For these other two scenarios, this species won out because it could move further. So given that this species cannot move very far and this species can move really far, what do you guys think would be the answer? What, what is your prediction for um, this particular scenario where you only have those patches in the middle? Do you think the first butterfly would be able to be more persistent or the second or equal? So one thing that we're not doing here, which our, my students usually would do, is to talk to each other before they decided. But you guys don't have to do that. But uh, depending on how you're using these, these clickers, you may want to, to set a, a, a usual practice for clickers. You know, if you don't want them to talk about it before they make their choice, say so. Otherwise, the default is you get to discuss your answer first. OK. So the students were as divided as you. They were not sure of which one would be better. Maybe the first one, maybe the second one, uh, maybe both OK. So we actually just did the experiment. And then, um, oh, sorry, wrong buttons. Oh, that's the wrong button, too. OK. So you know you practice with these before you actually take these to the classroom so students don't think you're an idiot. Um, so uh, we, we do the, the experiment online. There's a, a simulation model, as I mentioned. And it outputs these graphs where the percent persistence is on the y-axis and time is on the x-axis. So you get a pretty consistent result here. And uh, I don't actually you know, say much. I just say, this is what we got. So what do you think is, the, is, is more resistant to fragmentation, A, this fritillary, or B, that fritillary? What do you guys think? So, oop. yeah, so the students were pretty much um, uh, right on there with you guys. So this is how we were able to, to use clickers to do some higher order thinking of making predictions based on some information. We had some actually some interesting twists that I didn't expect to happen. So uh, the reason why some students thought some of these the predictions that they made, the, the way they justified their predictions were based on some things they made up themselves that I didn't actually tell them. And so that was fine. But um, by actually you know, talking about it, we realized, oh, they thought you know, there was some competition going on between the two species. Even though in the instructions I gave them, I did say there's no competition between the two species. But even though you know, that some of them were using that to make some of their decisions and their predictions, and that was incorrect. So by kind of going through it and then talking about it afterwards, we were able to uncover you know, some of the assumptions that they had made to make the predictions. So that was pretty fun. And I, I only just realized this the other day that um, Brian um, has written up a small uh, section on this uh, particular activity in the Clickers at PSU blog. So you can see his assessment of it there as well. OK. So that was how um, we use, use clickers to do predictions. Um, I also tried to, to break down some really complicated graphical models with clickers. And so here in this particular uh, concept, um, we're trying to teach students how to explain the broad scale patterns of where species are in, in, 
on the planet. So there are some general large-scale patterns that are based on a few different factors, and so that's what this model is about. So here's a, another example of where we construct knowledge together instead of me telling them, OK, the relationship between habitat isolation and species richness is x. I ask them to interpret the graphs and um, uh, tell me what the answer to a clicker question is. You guys want to do it? OK, of course. So I think there'll be about 15, unless um, some of you don't feel like answering. OK, that's pretty good. OK, so can I make this smaller, Brian, like this? No. Oh, OK. <laughs> no, yeah. <laughs> OK, so um, actually, the students kind of felt the same way, right? So they, they did sort of split up a little bit, too. Um, and what, what we talked about afterwards, so you know, I usually let them come up with their confusions on their own and ask me to explain, as opposed to say, say tell them, you know, oh, this is going to be hard because you're going to be interpreting more than one thing at a time here, and then explain later. So um, you could see that a, a bunch of them thought that it would be B because they were not really thinking about uh, the increase is this versus this. They were looking at this. So that, that was a tricky thing. And some of them still didn't get it, and they did come up to me afterwards. But we did talk about that for a really long time because I realized that that was something I didn't practice much was a complex graph where there was more than one factor going on at once. But still, they, did, they didn't do so bad. So that was definitely below my 90% threshold of, yeah, we got to spend some time explaining. OK, so then. There's a, another relationship between habitat area and species richness that goes in the opposite direction. And um, that one students got much more clearly because that is not as confusing of a graph to explain. Uh, the fun part is this thing that comes next. There's a model that uh, puts all the, these two things together, of area and isolation. And um, it's, it's used to model the number of species that you get on like real islands or these patches of different sizes. And so this is how I would used to do it. I would show it to them and explain all the different little parts and then maybe ask a clicker question. So this time around, I didn't do it like that. I set it up sort of like a scenario that we have this new island and we need to figure out how many species are going to be on it. So if we were, were going to go out there and measure, if we take a look at the number of species on this island, what is, what is the relationship between the colonization rate and the species richness. And I kind of limit their choices. The three different shapes that this curve can take are like that. And so they kind of like make a prediction. And so this one's a little bit hard, but they did most, more or less most of them get it right. So. Um, it's a little bit complex. I'm not going to explain it to you here because I'm not teaching you ecology. But um, uh, I didn't explain very much about what this model was going to be about at the beginning and just had them kind of do it on their intuition. And so the first question out of all this set of questions that I asked, a lot of them got it wrong because they didn't really understand what I was asking because I was kind of being purposely vague to see where they, what they know and what they don't know. And so then they, they catch up pretty fast. And you'll see from the, the results uh, how quickly they catch up. OK, so we got the first curve. And so then I asked them what this curve of extinction look, should look like. Should it be going up? Should it be the same as colonization? Or should there be uh, no relationship? And so then they, they start figuring it out. They, they, um, they reason out that A is the correct answer. And then I asked them, OK, interpret this thing you just made. Where, where, will, where, where on this graph is the number of species going to be on the island? So there, or at the intersection, or at the bottom there at the end. And they're really getting it right now. 
they're, they're getting better and better. So then we go through um, all the other lines. And so that involves a bunch of other scenarios. So you know, are the lines for the other scenarios going to be higher or lower? And see, they're, they're, they're getting pretty good at this. And then the last scenario for uh, colonization, there, it could be higher or lower. And they're, they're, they really have figured it out by now. And so, oh, did I go in the right direction? Yeah. So then um, the final question is to really interpret this model. So given all this whole set of lines we have here, this S that we marked before, what does it go to? And so they, they have, they're definitely figuring it out by now. And then the final question, oh, sorry. The final question is, oh, oh. OK, yeah, right. So yeah, so now you know how quickly, how often I back up. Uh, the, the final question is the real test. You know, this is what the model is meant to do. It's supposed to, to um, help you to be able to predict who's going to have the most species, who's going to have the fewest species. And uh, the correct answer is B. And just about everyone gets it right. So you kind of see how the, the wrong answers start to whittle away and more, pe more people get the right answer. And it's a very, very complex model. It's a very simple model as far as models go, but it's got a lot of complex pieces to it. And we kind of break it down and give it to them bit by bit and put them together. And, and they're able to do pretty well. So uh, clickers don't always you know, do exactly what you think they're going to do, just the same as any other active um, engagement sort of activity can go wrong. So I think this is what's coming up next. So one thing students really don't like is if you give them something that seems totally ambiguous and they're like, which is the right answer? Because they want to know what the right answer is. So the question here is, you know, interpret these graphs. If you have the number of birds in the stripe bars is where you don't get deers. Uh, you don't allow deer in, and the solid bars where you do allow deer in, which bird species is the one that is the least affected? So I didn't construct this probably very well. I should have said port most, which does the worst, or, or something like that, so you could interpret it either way. Um, but I found, uh, after probing the students, that the students who were answering both of these were right for, dif for different correct reasons. And it was kind of cool. So yeah. This was supposed to be the answer that I expected it to be. Um, but many students put this one because they were looking at the differences in the sizes of these bars. And so for this species, there's only a few instances where the two sizes of bars are not the same. And so they're like, they don't care about the deer. There's something else that's controlling their, their um, abundance. So that was, that was interesting to show them something that was not quite right, um, though I didn't think about that ahead of time and um, get the split, but then find the reasoning for um, this alternate answer, which was also sort of correct. But Carla was in the audience. She heard them grumble a lot. Anytime the sort of thing showed up, and there wasn't really a correct answer, uh, they grumbled a lot. They're like, there's got to be one right answer. And uh, um, I think in the future, uh, I would probably set the students up earlier to, n to understand there's not always one right answer. There's often a best answer, but sometimes there's two best answers, or they're all pretty good. Um, so you know, getting st now that I kind of see where students get tripped up and what they get sort of obsessed over, I would try to get those things out of the way ahead of time. But this generated a bunch of discussion. I mean, we talked about this for a really long time because some people were like, "Well, no, you know, it's not that because you know they clearly there's a big difference there." And they would go on and on and on, and um, it, it generated plenty of discussion that I didn't really have to facilitate very much. So that was pretty cool that a clicker question can generate discussion in a classroom of 300 students. So I'll just sum up here. I uh, showed you some different examples of how um, you can make using clickers in the classroom just a bit more interesting for yourself as well as for the students um, by you know, setting things up so that students can come up with the knowledge themselves and derive it themselves instead of you just telling them. Um, for instant application and for doing things like making predictions and doing experiments in class. Um, 
taking something very complicated and breaking it down into smaller pieces. And then finally, this is a little scary, but you can definitely generate lots of discussion, sometimes the, when you least expect it. So that's all I have. I'd be glad to answer any questions about using clickers, any of the activities that I showed you, et cetera. Right, so just for the benefit of the recording, the question was, how do you coordinate amongst courses? Are you using the same clicker or different clickers? Well, here on this campus, we've all gone to the iClicker system. And I guess Brian can actually answer for other campuses. They, they could still choose to do something different, I think. Yeah, so they can use the same clicker from one class as they do in another. And all the podiums on campus will be set up with something like this. Um, and if you teach in a classroom that doesn't have a podium, then you get to, to use one of those bases, which looks like, looks like a, your little wireless router in your house, probably. So the question was, you know, how, can I assess whether or not higher order thinking has occurred, and, and you know, what are the benchmarks of that? Well, I've only taught this class twice, and both times with clickers. The first time I taught in a very, fairly standard lecture style format where I gave information and then asked immediately with a clear question, what, what, is the, what did I just say? Um, so I can say that the, the test that has a lot of mathematical equations on it, uh, this time around, there the, the class mean was a few points higher. So it could be due to using clickers differently or some combination of a more active acti uh, um, style of lecturing um, in combination with using clickers differently. Yeah, I have act actually, since there's now a student who's working in my group who was in my class last semester, um, I asked him, you know, what, how did you feel about these clickers? And then, well, first he said, I hate these things. Um, but then I asked him, okay, sure, um, I understand that, you know, they're not always that great. But um, these are the kinds of things that I was trying to do with them. How do you feel that worked? And he's like, yeah, actually, it was the way that we use clickers in Bio 220 was way more interesting than in any, any of my other classes. Like, it was much more engaging and effective, and I felt like um, I was actually doing something in class, and I needed to be there to be able to get this knowledge. So I think that you know that, that was just like one student out of 300. But I feel like if one student was able to say that, then hopefully others would too. There was a question over here first, right? So the question is, where where did all this come from? So I'll be honest, most of it came from my head, and some of it didn't work really well. That's why, because it came from my head. Um, but there are, but you're right. There are uh, uh, clicker banks of questions out there, and they do vary by field where they are. Um, but I think some very simple things that you can do is uh, the, the the number one one here, constructing knowledge together, is um, much more. Uh, um, it's much easier to do than you think, um, because for most science scientific fields, there are graphs that students have to interpret. Um, they, you know, they have a hard time interpreting graphs and the first time I taught this class I would spend like a minute on every single figure to say this axis says this, this axis says this, this is what this point means and that point means. And now I don't do that anymore at all. I spend no time on that and the students can do it or if they can't do it someone near them can do it and, and they tell them. So I feel like that is the simplest one you can get started on. You can always rely on that. You know, interpret this data for me and then what does it say? Um, but some of the other ones, you know, I, I definitely over the course of this past semester, I started getting more and more complicated and doing these more and more creative sorts of things or unusual sorts of things. And um, uh, but I'd definitely be glad to help you come up with questions, any of you, if if you have some concept that you want to try to ask questions about. Oh, how many do I ask? Okay, how many clicker questions do I ask? Uh, it kind of depends. So the one where I broke down that graphical model, I think that one had. 10 or something like that. But sometimes they're as few as three or four. Um, and they all, all usually are spaced, if I don't do them all throughout, they would be spaced every 10 or f five or 10 minutes, something like that, um, 10 or 15 minutes, something in that kind of range. So they're always stopping to do something with material that I have presented. Uh, so w what is it, what do you do when very few people respond? Well, so our clickers are worth points, and so they have every incentive to respond. Um, 
So there's not usually that sort of scenario, but sometimes I'll get the responses coming in really slow. So like in this little window up here, you'll see the numbers go up really, really slow. So I'll just pause it and say, OK, clearly we need a little more time to think about what this answer is. Do you have any questions for me? Is there some information you need? And so then we'll, we'll start it over again. And that's happened more than once. I mean, if you start with thinking about clickers as a multiple choice question, you probably have written multiple choice questions. Um, you know, and if you try to be organized about you know, what is it that you want them to know and how is it you want them to know it, then you write your multiple choice question and then you can insert it into your lecture appropriately. I don't do it that backwards. As I don't do it in that much of a backward design way. Mine's more of a stream of consciousness and sometimes it works. But if I were to do it in an organized way, I would try to do it like that. So I do give them my learning objectives, which shows what level at which I want them to know something. They need to synthesize or they yeah. need to recall. So um, I don't necessarily use the same questions as from my clickers right. as on the, the exam itself. Are they similar in construction? Uh, they are pretty similar. I okay. use sort of the same language. Okay. Of course, some things are different when you don't have pictures and that sort right. of stuff. You describe it by words or something yeah. like that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so um, but they still don't. They, I still did get complaints that the clickers were not like the exam questions. And I did, though, because I knew I already felt like they weren't going to be, you couldn't just study the questions to yeah. study for the test. You had to study the objectives. And so they weren't going to do that. They were going to study the clicker questions and then totally and miss the objectives. The right. So the second set of exams, I gave them some practice questions. Like, these are going to be more like what's on the, the exam. And, and they're not like the, the clickers. Yeah. Yeah, so do, can, can you not assign points and still get this to work? In theory, I've heard you can. So I'm part of a postdoctoral program called FIRST4, Faculty Institutes for Reforming Science Teaching, something like that. It's an NSF-funded project. And there's one of our team leaders there, several of them actually, who are very against assigning points. They don't do that at all. And it apparently works for them. But it is part of how you construct your classroom environment. So if everyone has accountability, then they are going to participate in some way. So you know, e even if you, know, you don't get any points for clicking in, I mean, everyone wants to, to push a button, right? And it's even better if you don't have to, um, if, if you don't get graded on it. You, it doesn't matter what you, you put in. Um, and how you kind of avoid from getting things that are spurious is you tie it to something else. You know, so you know when students are doing well or doing poorly because they're actually not getting the material. It's not because they were thinking about their Facebook page and just hitting some button. Sometimes I would ask the students, you know, how comfortable are you with this amount of knowledge or this, this concept on a scale of one to five? And so when they can see how other people feel about whatever this hard thing we just did was, and I do something about it the next day, they're like, OK, I have input. I'm using these clickers to to contribute to the knowledge in the classroom and how this classroom is, operates, then they're more likely to want to use them also. Well, let's thank Sue Ann again. Thank you.